Yesterday we had an amazing vacation Bible school. If you look over here to my right and your left, you will see a very detailed, accurate to scale description of Daniel and his lion's den. And we taught the children that came, what do we do when we're afraid? Who remembers the memory verse? What do we do? What is it? When I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. It's easy to get scared. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us 365 times in the Scriptures, fear not. One for every day of the year. So every day when we wake up, there's a verse in the Bible telling us to not be afraid. There's a verse in His Word telling us not to fear. That happened to our disciples in the book of Acts. That's where we're going through these past few weeks. They told them to go. God gave them a command and a proclamation. We're going to see that up on the screen in just a moment here today. I want to talk to you today about being a risk taker. Why is it that we're so afraid to take a risk? Why is it that we're so afraid to go all out completely for God? I want to talk to you this morning about going and telling the gospel, taking a risk. The Bible tells us in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, it'll be up here on your screen. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This was the declaration that Jesus gave to them once he rose from the grave. Now let's skip ahead 40 days to Acts 1a, this is what Jesus said. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and into the uttermost part of the earth. God, through His Son Jesus, gave us a command to go and to tell. He told the disciples, I'm going up to heaven, I'm going to send you a comforter, and your job now is to go and tell the people about me. Go spread my message to the whole world. And the disciples said, Okay, Lord. And they stayed in Jerusalem. They didn't go, and they didn't tell. Now, great things happened in Jerusalem. There were healings, there were miracles, there were signs, there were wonders. People were added to the church daily. But when they got to the edge of that barrier, they stopped. You remember the story of the Hobbit, when Frodo and Sam are heading out to destroy the ring? And they're walking, and they get to a gate at the end of a farmer's field, and Frodo keeps on walking, but Sam stops right at the edge of the gate. And Frodo looks around and says, What's the matter, Sam? And Sam says, If I take one more step, this will be the farthest that I've ever been in my entire life. A lot of us as Christians today have stopped right there at the edge of the gate. I'm very comfortable being a Christian as long as I'm in my comfort zone. As long as I'm around other people that are Christians, it's very easy for me to worship the Lord inside of church when I'm surrounded by other believers. But when I'm out there in the world, when everybody's against me, when persecution comes against me, I get very timid. I get very scared. I get very afraid. Why are we like that? Why are we like that? I think it's because our life consists of a series of risks. We're presented with circumstances, the outcome of which is uncertain. We assess the situation and based on a series of internal calculations, either take a risk by faith or we pass on it. You see a toddler deciding to take his or her first steps. You see a teenager deciding to ask for their first date. It's coming. Those of you with kids, get ready. Start praying, lock your doors, get your shotguns. Your kids are going to start dating soon. You see a parent deciding when to hand over the keys to their car for the first time. You see a business owner making a critical hire. You see it in a person who failed the first time trying to decide whether to get up and try again. You see it all throughout our lives. These decisions we make are based on several factors. First one is, am I naturally a risk taker? Some of us are naturally risk takers. We're bold and we're envisioned and we'll jump out and do something. There are others of us that are very cautious. Usually God works it out so when you marry somebody, you marry your opposite. If one of you in the household are very ambitious and risky, the other one is very conservative and cautious. If you're both conservative and cautious, 
you'll live a very good life, but it'll be very boring. If you're both risk takers, you'll be a very fun life, but it'll be very broke. So it's good to have a balance back and forth. And then we ask ourselves, what do our past experiences tell us? If we've been down this road before, success or failure will color our current choices. Well, we did that before and it didn't work out. Or I tried this once before and it didn't work. And so if it didn't work this time, there's no reason to try it again. And then we ask what other people say about it. I have a friend, I'm not going to mention his name because he might watch this on YouTube. But he calls me all the time for advice. He'll say, Jason, what do you think about this? And I'll give him very detailed advice what I think about it. And he'll call 10 other people asking him the same question. What do you think about this? And they'll all give him advice. And then when he's done, he'll do whatever he wanted to do anyway. I asked him, why do you keep wasting our time? I just want to know what your thoughts are on the opinion. We do that a lot. We always ask, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And we're willing to go around and ask everybody else except for the only one whose opinion really matters. That's God. I can't see into the future. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But God knows. And the Bible says that He's ordered my steps. And so I need to be exactly and precisely in His will because there is no better place for me to be than exactly and precisely in the will of God. And then we ask ourselves, is the potential gain worth the possible pain? We do a quick risk and reward calculation to determine whether or not this might be a step too far. Seldom are the stakes higher in the risk-reward equation than when it involves relationships. Entering into a new relationship with a person. Breaking off a destructive relationship with a person. Choosing to forgive and possibly restore broken relationships. You've heard the old adage, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. When something happens and we get burned, we take a step back, we put up a brick wall, and we say, we're not going to take this risk again. It's not worth it. But our measurements and calculations of what we should and shouldn't do shouldn't be based on those around us. They should be based on what God's calling is upon our lives. It's risky to love people. People will hurt you. Sometimes people can't be trusted. We've all been burned by someone in the past. And the idea of taking a risk on other people might not be very appealing. But that's exactly what God has in mind for us. And sometimes on the surface, it makes very little sense. That's exactly the circumstances we find our story in today. A man named Barnabas, in the book of Acts, if you'll go there, chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, beginning with verse 26 through 31, he had to make a decision to take a risk on a relationship that no one around him was willing to do. He overcame a number of common obstacles to taking risks by faith, and he invested in a risky relationship that ultimately shaped the course of Christianity. Let's read that together. Acts chapter 9, 26 to 31. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, but they were about to slay him. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea, and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. You know the story if you've been with us. We've been going through it the past few weeks. There was a man named Saul, and he was absolutely positively convinced that Christianity was a plague that had to be wiped out. So he set out to systematically destroy the children of God. But on his way to Damascus with orders in his hand from the high priest to destroy and imprison the Christians, <clears throat> a light from heaven came down and Jesus showed up and said, Paul, what do you think you're doing? And Paul had a revelation from the Lord. And when he saw Jesus, everything changed. He was healed. He was converted. And Saul, the persecutor, became Paul, the apostle. 
It's amazing what happens when we enter into the presence of Jesus. If you've ever truly had an experience or an encounter with Jesus, you will not be the same. Something always changes in our lives. And so this apostle who became Paul decided to go and preach the gospel of Jesus, the man who he saw, the man who he was persecuting. But there was a problem with that because when he decided to go to Jerusalem and meet the other apostles, they didn't want to have anything to do with him because all they remembered was his past. How many of us have been judged not by our current outlook on life or circumstances, but because of situations we've done in our past? How many other people do we constantly have a prejudice against because of something they did in their past? How many times does God tell me to forgive? How many times? What do I do to take these risks? It sounded too good to be true. Saul, the guy that's going to kill us, is now one of us? I don't believe it. It's a trick. It's a trap. He's going to be a spy. He's going to infiltrate our organization. He's going to destroy us from within. It's a trick. It's a trap. There's no way he converted. We know him. We know Saul. We've seen him. It's really sad to say, but a lot of us look at people, and all we see are their outward selves, and we say, they'll never make it. They have no business serving God. But like we've said before, it's not our job to be fruit inspectors. It's our job to be fruit producers. God's the one who judges. He's the one who lets us know the intent of their heart because we don't know. All I can see is what's on the outside. God's the only one who knows the heart. So I have to trust Him. But I understand what the disciples went through. It's very easy for us to have doubt. It's very easy for us to be afraid to take a risk. It's very easy for us to want to wash our hands of someone because they've done things in the past that we don't agree with. They've hurt us in the past. I guarantee you, if everybody in here closed their eyes and thought for a second, a name would pop up of somebody that's hurt you in your past. Somebody that said a hurtful word. Somebody that stabbed you in the back and twisted the knife. Somebody that's caused you grief and pain. You can think of them right now. But I also know this. The Bible says that if I want God to forgive my trespasses... I have to forgive those that have trespassed against me. And if I can't forgive them, how can I expect God to forgive me? So what keeps us from taking a risk? What are the three things that keep us from taking a risk today? We're going to look at them right now. Number one, fear. Fear keeps us from taking a risk. We talked about fear yesterday in vacation Bible school. We talked about the story of Daniel being tossed into the lion's den and how frightening it must have been to be in there in the dark surrounded by hungry lions and bones of deceased people from the past, and knowing that except for a miracle from God, he wasn't going to make it till the morning. But the Bible says an angel came and shut the lion's mouths. And so we learn that if we are afraid, all we have to do is trust in him. My Bible says that perfect love casteth out fear. If I have the love of God in my heart, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know who's on the throne. I know how big my God is. Sometimes all we see is how big our circumstance is, but we need to remember how much bigger our God is. Sometimes we feel failure when we're starting a new project or business venture. Sometimes we're afraid of rejection, especially in a relationship. We wonder, will they accept me as I am? Can I tell them this part about my past? Can I really open up to them? When it comes to taking a risk on someone who's hurt us in the past, we're most afraid of being hurt again. Maybe you've been hurt by an ex, a business partner, an employer, or a child. And they come to us and they say, I've changed. And we want to believe they've changed, but we're afraid. Saul had hurt people. He had thrown men and women into prison. He had broken up families. He had had people killed and stoned to death. He wasn't just opposed to Christianity. He was dedicated to destroying it. If you were a Christian living back then and you heard that Saul was coming to town, you would run and you would hide. When he showed up in Jerusalem, no doubt a rumor began to spread that he had changed. The wise thing would have been to disregard the rumor. Remember, the disciples weren't just protecting themselves. They were protecting the entire community that they were in charge of, of believers. Taking a risk on one man just didn't seem worth it. Oftentimes, fear can sound a lot 
like wisdom. Do you really think that's a good idea? Did you really hear from God about that? You aren't afraid of failing. You're just being careful. But God doesn't rationalize our fear. He conquers it. That's why God told Joshua in Joshua 1.9, Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee wherever thou goest. Can you understand that God is on our side? That He is in our corner and He is rooting for us. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is in Zephaniah where it says, God sings over His children. God's in heaven singing over us right now. Jesus is in heaven making an advocate for us in the presence of the Heavenly Father. We have God on our side. Who shall I fear? Who shall I be afraid of? Essentially, he was saying to Joshua the same thing he says to us today. Get moving. Don't be afraid. Just go and I'll go with you. Fear wants to keep us right where we are and God has a better destination for us. That's the number one. Fear will keep us from taking a risk. What's number two? Doubt. Doubt will keep us from taking a risk. If you've been in the disciples' place, would you have believed God could change Saul? There's a lot of people we think God can change, but there's not a whole lot of people we think God does change. You know the saying, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Saul, the number one enemy of Christians, becoming one of them sounded way too good to be true. It's understandable to be wary when someone comes to us claiming to have changed. What if they're wrong? What if they're lying? We'll just get hurt again. Maybe you've been hurt by someone over and over. Now you're at the point where you don't feel like you can trust that person ever again. Trust is a very difficult thing to regain. It truly is. It truly, truly is. We know we're supposed to believe God can change everybody. But there just seems like there's so many people out there that never change. And if we're talking about a person who can harm us, the safest thing is to stick with our doubts, right? Why take a risk on a lost cause? Fear and doubt keep us from taking a risk on relationships. But there's another far more sinister reason. Number three, cynicism. Cynicism keeps us from taking a risk. Cynicism happens when we decide that our preconceived prejudices represent reality. We apply them to everyone and everything. Cynicism thinks it knows better. People don't change. They can't be trusted. Risks are never worth it. We figured out the way things really work. We aren't about to be taken in like everyone else. We know what people are really like. We know their game, their motives, and we won't be fooled again. When we're cynics, we like to say, I'm just being realistic. But you know what cynicism is? Cynicism is taking all of our fear and our doubts and making them hard. We forge them into an armor we can wear to protect us from the world. That's what real cynicism is. Now, I don't think all the disciples in these verses were cynics, but I bet a few of them were. You can't see your friends get arrested or killed without becoming a little hardened. A few of the disciples probably didn't care if it was true or not. Who cares about Saul? Let him figure out his own life. This is what he gets for all he's done. How many of us have tried to be judge and jury over somebody else because of what they've done. Cynicism hardens our hearts to true relationship and makes future potential friends pay for the sins of past relationships. When we have to take a chance on someone, fear says they might hurt you. Doubt says they probably haven't changed. Cynicism says they will hurt you and they will never change. These are the things that keep us from taking a risk. What about you? Which of these things do you struggle with in your life? We're not alone. The disciples were feeling all of these things, which is why they steered clear of Saul. His conversion could have been an act meant to trick them, or it could have been a temporary change. I've seen it a lot in the music world. A musician all of a sudden just finds Jesus. I don't know where he was, but they find him. And they decide they're a Christian. They, they release a song or an album that's a Christian song or an album. And it tanks and doesn't do any good. All of a sudden, they're not Christians anymore. That happens over and over and over again. People start off good. They drop off by the wayside. And because it happens so much, we've grown hard and cynical. Somebody comes by the church and says, I'm hungry. I need money for food. You give them money for food. You see them a week later at the same place doing the same thing again. We get hard in our hearts, don't we? 
We say, if I give you this, you're just going to get drugs or alcohol. If I help you out, you're just going to come back in. I'm just enabling you. We've become so embittered towards the people in this world because there's a few people that are bad apples that ruin it for everybody else. And we've put on a suit of armor that wants to protect us from them. But in reality, what we're doing is building a wall of separation instead of being able to reach out the hand of God to these people. Only one person in the Bible is willing to consider the possibility that Saul really had changed, that he had really had an encounter with Jesus. That person was Barnabas. I don't know why Barnabas decided to go looking for Saul. Maybe the Holy Spirit led him, just like he did Ananias. I don't know much about Barnabas' background or his history. I do know that his name means son of encouragement. And we see him acting as mediator other times as well. Maybe this was just Barnabas' personality. Some people are just really good at helping other people. We have quite a lot of those in this church. If you were here yesterday, you would have seen the amazing love that this church has for the people in this community. Willing to take time and reach out and help them right where they are. And to point them to the cross, to point them to Jesus. But whatever the reason, Barnabas decided to look for Saul and find out the truth for himself. And what he found out changed everything. So what did Barnabas do? And how can we be more like him? What does it look like for us to take a risk on the people God loves? We're going to look at three things. This is the first one here. How can we be a Barnabas for somebody else? The first thing is this. We take time to hear their story. Someone said the reason God gave us two ears and one mouth is because He intended us to listen twice as much as we talk. I think some of us guys have that backwards. Wisdom, according to Doug Larson, is the reward you get for a lifetime of listening when you'd have preferred to talk. And Stephen Covey says it like this, Most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. If while someone's talking to me, all I'm doing is working on my argument to bring back to them, I'm not listening to a word they said. I haven't heard them. Barnabas, listen. There are five words that could transform a relationship. That's interesting. Tell me more. Simple words, but incredibly inviting. Try it sometime. The recipient will usually react, relax, and open up. And true understanding begins to take place. The rest of the disciples assume they do everything they needed to know about Saul. Either they assume they already knew his story or they were too afraid to find out differently. Have you ever been driving your car and somebody cut you off? No blinkers, no warning? What do you think about that person? Don't say it out loud. I don't want anybody to get in trouble. What do you think about that person when they cut you off? There's no excuse for that sort of behavior. But what always happens? A little while later down the road, that same day you're driving, you change lanes, and you realize you just cut somebody off. And you can see them in the rearview mirror, and they're mad and they're honking. But you aren't mad at yourself, are you? No. You think, I didn't see them, or I was distracted. See, we know the circumstances of our mistakes. So we're a lot more forgiving. When we don't know someone else's story, it keeps distance between us and them. It makes it easier to judge them, to write them off, and to be afraid of them. When we listen to someone else's story, our opinion of them often changes because we understand them. We realize where they're coming from, the circumstances that might have affected their choices and behavior. Barnabas needed to hear Saul's story for himself. He needed to know the circumstances behind his conversion, what really happened to change him. And boy, did Saul have a story to tell. My goodness. What an amazing story it is to see Jesus face to face. The second thing we can do is, number two, verify the facts. If all we do is take someone at their word, there can be devastating consequences. It's important to remember that Barnabas didn't insist the church welcome Saul until he had met with him to check out his story. This is my church and I'm responsible for this church. So I don't just let anybody walk in and preach to you. Because no matter what, if I don't say it, I'm still responsible for whatever comes out from here. So I check out their story first. I go and hear them preach somewhere else first. I spend them having conversations with them first because I'm responsible. You don't just open up your door to let anybody in without being responsible. Barnabas was willing to check out the story himself and verify the facts. Being willing to take risks on people does not mean we open ourselves up to the abuse. We need to discern for ourselves whether God is truly at work in their lives, or whether they're simply trying to manipulate us. 
There's a big difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Everybody has to forgive. That's Bible. That's a given. But reconciliation is not always a good idea. If reconciliation is to occur, facts must be verified. Has true repentance occurred? Is there a willingness to make restitution? Is there evidence of a changed life? I don't know what Barnabas and Saul talked about. But I do know that whatever Barnabas heard was enough to convince him that Saul was the real deal. Now watch this. Once he found out that his doubts were assured, he immediately went to talk to the church. He didn't wait around a month or two just to see what happens. He knew it was time for Saul to meet the apostles. If you have doubts about somebody, verify the facts. But once you do, keep moving. Don't let our doubts cement us in place and keep us from the path God has called us to do. So we listen and we verify. There's something else we need to do if we're going to be a Barnabas for somebody else. Number three, we trust in God's power. The third thing is actually the first thing we need to do. We reject cynicism and trust in God's power. If we decide to take a risk on someone and yet begin the process with a cynical attitude, we're not taking a risk at all. We're just waiting for the person to fail us because we're assuming that they will. If we're really going to take a risk on people God loves, we need to get rid of our cynicism right at the beginning. You never see Jesus being cynical in the Gospels. Why is that? Cynics pride themselves on being realistic, on understanding the way the world really works. No one understands people or the world better than Jesus. So why wasn't he a cold, jaded cynic? Because he knew the power of God. Jesus understood better than anybody else that God could transform people. When some of the Sadducees tried to trap him with a trick question, Jesus told them what their problem was. Matthew twenty two twenty nine says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Cynicism in a hardened heart cannot be our starting point. We must trust in the power of God because if He can't change people, no one can. In each of His appearances in the book of Acts, Barnabas exudes confidence and trust in God's power. He's willing to intercede for people whom others had given up on. He knew what God could do, and he went to Saul without any hesitation. These are the people that fall through the cracks of a marginalized society. These are the people that everybody gives up on or turns a blind eye to. These are the ones that need to hear the gospel the most. Instead of hardening our hearts, we need to open our doors. That doesn't mean we're naive. That doesn't mean we're stupid. What that means is we believe that God has the power to transform anyone. And I allow myself to be a willing vessel of God and declare the gospel to everyone I come in contact with. It's not my job to make the seeds grow. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But it's my job to plant the seed. I cannot control the soil. I can't control if it's fertile ground, whether there's rocks, whether there's thorns, or whether it's stony. All I can do is present the seed. That's our job as Christians, to declare the word. That's what Barnabas did for Paul, and that's what we need people to do today. At some point in our lives, we've all had a Barnabas in our corner. Someone who believed in us when no one else did. They were willing to take a risk on us, and it changed our lives. If you look back, you can think of a time and of a person who was willing to take a chance on you, willing to take a risk on you. I read a story once of a famous author. He was on the New York Times bestsellers list. He'd written a lot of books, and he was very famous. He decided to go back to his old hometown to visit. And while he was there, he ran into one of his teachers who was in her 90s and who taught him when he was a young man. And he said to her, I bet you never thought I'd make it this far. I was quite a troublemaker in school. And she said, no, no. I knew you'd be good. That's why I prayed for you every day. He said, no, there's no way. Are you serious? She said, yes. Every single day I prayed for you. Long after you left my class, long after you moved to the next grade, I continued to pray for you. God needs some people who are willing to be intentional in their prayers, who are willing to declare the goodness of the Lord. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. We said, pick one person in your life, one person who needs to hear the gospel, and intentionally every day pray for that person. Pray for God to send someone to them. Pray for God to open a door of opportunity so you can go to them. 
God needs some sons of encouragement. Somebody who's willing to say, yes, you're welcome. Yes, the gospel's for you. Everybody in here has a testimony. Everybody in here has a place where they were from. We don't know everybody's story. I don't know how far off you were before God found you. But I do know God found you. I know I was lost, but now I'm found. I know I was blind, but now I can see. And I know that Jesus died for me, just like he died for you, just like he died for everyone else. His blood is the great equalizer. Rich, poor, old, young, good, bad, indifferent. His blood covers all. It is our great honor and our awesome obligation to share the gospel with everyone. God needs some encouragers. Are you willing to be an encourager this morning? Are you willing to declare the good news and take a risk on somebody to give them the gospel? If I can have somebody come to the piano, please. We're getting ready to close. Sometime in our lives, we needed a Barnabas. Sometime in our lives, we needed somebody who was willing to put their arm around our shoulder to lead us in, to lift us up, to pray for us, to care for us, to believe in us. That's a hard thing to do. But somebody did it for me. Somebody believed in me. That's why I'm here. Somebody believed in you. That's why you're here. <clears throat> now it's our turn to be a Barnabas for somebody else. We need to move past our fear and be willing to hear their story. We need to overcome our doubts by verifying the facts. And we need to reject our cynicism and trust in God's power. Barnabas took a risk and it changed the world. Paul revolutionized the gospel to the Gentiles. If it wasn't for Paul, we wouldn't be here today. There would be no church without Paul. There would be no message to the Gentiles without Paul. And Paul would have never been accepted had it not been for Barnabas. Everybody knows who Billy Graham is. You've heard him on TV. You've read one of his books. But do you know the man who, when he was a boy, drove him to Sunday school and he got saved? Nobody knows his name. Nobody knows his story. But somebody's willing to take a chance and have somebody get saved. Who knows who the Billy Graham of tomorrow is? Maybe somebody that God places in your path. It's somebody that needs encouragement that needs to be believed in. God believes in you. We talked about it in Sunday school. Sometimes we have a warped view of ourselves. We see ourselves the way other people around us see us. Or we see ourselves based on our rejections and our failures and our shortcomings. And that's the image that we have. We carry that image around with us like a weight around our neck. And it stoops us over. Makes us old. Makes us afraid. But God doesn't see us like that. God sees us through His eyes. We are His children. He sent His Son for us. My prayer for you today is that this week we can see through God's eyes and not see race or color or creed or socioeconomic status, but see souls that desperately need the gospel message. Barnabas took a risk and changed the world. God's asking us to do the same. Are you looking for opportunities to take risks in faith? Who needs you to be their Barnabas today? There's somebody out there that needs a word of encouragement. God's going to intentionally place them in your path. Pray about it. Be ready when the time comes to share the gospel message. And let them know who our Savior is. Let's all stand and pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, this day that somebody was willing to take a risk on me. That somebody was willing to take a risk on the people here, Lord, to share the gospel message with them. God, sometimes we hurt people's feelings. Sometimes our own feelings get hurt. Sometimes we're despised and we're rejected. But your word says that you've overcome this world. And it's our job to share your message. I ask you today to make us a Barnabas a son and daughter of encouragement to declare the goodness of you, to reach out to those that everybody else would turn away from and reject, to reach out to those that everybody else has put up a wall against, Lord, to let them know today that you are God, you are on the throne, 
And Jesus Christ died for their sins. If no one else will go, Lord, send us. Let this church be a lighthouse and a beacon of hope in this community. And let the people know that this is the place where they are free to come, free to worship, and free to hear from you. And all these things we give you the praise because you are God and you alone are worthy. In your precious Son's name, that name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen.